Hello again, it's uh, Mr. Miller. Um, now, obviously, as a head of year, I can't really have a favourite faculty. Uh, I'll just put it this way. I teach a lot of geography. I really, really love geography. And geography is something I spend a lot of my time doing. Anyway, uh, please do enjoy the Global Faculties subject tutorials. Hello Year Sixes, my name is Miss Sander and I'm a Geography teacher here at Hinchin Brook School. I'm going to take in a whistle stop tour of our department and show you a snippet of a lesson that you might do when you come here. So, here is the Peeps building, okay, and this is where all your geography lessons would take place. Okay, it looks a little bit different right now because of the strange times that we're going through. Okay, there's very few desks in the classroom, as you may imagine. So, our first classroom I'll take you to is Mr Milner. So, Mr Milner is the head of Year 7, so he'll be your head of year when you arrive. As you can see, it's a little bit different because very few desks. It looks very empty. Okay, this is how it might be come September. This is Mr Evans' classroom. He's the head of geography here. So he might be your teacher when you come. Here we've got our lovely display boards. So if your work is amazing, you will end up with your work on the display boards, either in classrooms or out here. Here's some of our field trips we go on as a geography department. Sicily and Italy, the Dorset coast, Iceland, you might recognise Huntington Town. You might also have been to Hunstanton. Okay. So, here is um, my classroom, if you have me next year, this is where you'll be with me. This is Mrs Black and Mr Moody's classroom, and last but not least, we have Mrs Moist's classroom here at the end. Okay, so, I'm going to take you to Mr Durrant's classroom, because his classroom is my favourite. So, if you have Mr. Durrant, you will be in here. Now, what to bring to a geography lesson? In geography department, we have things like calculators, glue sticks, whiteboards, whiteboard markers, colouring pencils, rulers, normal pencils, scissors, protractors and compasses. But, I really advise you to always have pen, pencil, ruler, rubber, on you at all times and if you can your own calculator in case there's not enough supplies in every classroom okay you'll need those for every lesson so when you come one of the topics we'll go through is earthquakes and volcanoes now i love earthquakes and volcanoes my favorite topic so this is one of my favorite lessons from that topic some of you might have already done volcanoes in primary school which is great and some of you might have not so we'll start from the very basics and teach you all about the layers of the earth. We'll teach you how the crust of the earth is broken up into pieces called plates. Okay, and this lesson goes to the different plate boundaries. Plate boundaries being the edge of a plate. I'll open up with a map like this of all the tectonic plates of the earth. And I'll ask you to see if you can see three different ways that the plates meet. After we discuss that as a class, we'll come up with the idea that there are three different plate boundaries, three different ways of plates meet. Now, like a normal lesson in primary school, you'll have exercise books and you'll have a title and a name and you'll write the date and underline them all like any lesson you're doing. Now, three types of plate boundaries. I might play a video and go into detail for these in a lesson, but right now, just this short video, I'll quickly explain what each one is so that you understand the task. Constructive is where plates come apart, magma pops up through the crust and forms nice gentle volcanoes like in Iceland. Destructive plate boundary are where the plates are going towards each other and one gets forced underneath and there you get explosive volcanoes, okay? Like in Chile and South America, for example. 
Last of eight boundaries we'll look at is conservative. That's where they just slide along one another. No plate goes forward or back or underneath. They slide along, but they do create earthquakes, like in California and the USA. So, when we've done these three and explained them, you will then have a task like this worksheet, where you need to explain each of the plate boundaries on your worksheet. And when I know that everybody understands all three really well, then we'll do something like a stop animation film. So I imagine most of you know what this is. Okay, so I won't play the demo for you. But I'll give out Play-Doh and in pairs, either on your own phones or I come and record your mine, you'll make a stop animation film out of photos. Okay, to show how one of the plate boundaries, or all three if you're really good, work. So, I'm going to bring you forward to show you what I would do for a constructive plate boundary. I might have a photo of two plates together. Then when they pull apart, magma appearing between them. Then when they pull apart even more, more magma kind of building up in layers, you see. And then layers and layers of magma coming through. It cools into what's called lava. And that kind of builds up our volcano, if you can see. Okay, so you might go one, oh, one, two, three, four. Okay, in your video, or even better, you probably are better with play than I am. Okay, and when everyone's done a stop motion animation film like that, I might show some examples to the class. Then I would play a game for something like Simon Says. And I would say, Miss Sander says, I would say a type of plate boundary like constructive. He has to go quick like this. Okay? And someone does it wrong, sit down, out of the game. And then when people get really good and they know all three and they're really quick, the slowest person to get the correct one loses it out of the game. Okay? So that's how it ends. And that's a quick bit of a lesson for you for in Hingebrook. Now, over the summer, what you could do is you can make a model of your very own volcano. It might be out of modelling clay. It might be a cake. I've seen really nice cakes with red icing as the lava coming out of the volcano. Oh, yeah, a cardboard, a paper mache. It could be anything you find in your house. Okay, and you can bring it in to show us come September. So that's my task to you for the summer, to make a model of, any, of a volcano with anything you have in your house. Thank you so much for listening, Year Sixes. I hope you have a wonderful summer and I can't wait to meet you all in September. Hi future Year Sevens, Miss Brown here. I'm here to give you a tour of the History Department, the best department at Hinton Brook School. We're going to start by looking in Mr Wheelie's classroom. Mr Wheelie has been teaching here at Hinton Brook for 15 years and was also a student here. As hard as we've tried to get rid of him, he's been stuck here forever, which shows what a good school we have. Next, we're going to be looking at Miss Fender's classroom, so if you'd like to come this way. Miss Fender is the head of department here at Hinton Brook School. She is a top kahuna, head honcho. She's also our resident Welsh citizen, so you can find her in all her glory at rugby time. Next up, I'm going to show you around Mr. Ragdale's classroom, if you'd like to come on through. Mr. Ragdale is our resident expert on historical architecture, which is so important at Hinchinbrook School, as we have our own heritage site, Hinchinbrook House. We'll be using this in lots of our lessons, so you become very familiar with it. This is the history race, where you'll find all of your history teachers scoffing their faces at lunch and break time. Enter at your own risk. We're very lucky here in the History Department as we have the expertise of two members of the Senior Leadership Team. This is where you'll be taught by Mrs Tandy and Miss Nightingale, who are very experienced his history teachers. You'll find my classroom just up those stairs at the end of the corridor. They've had to expel me from the History Department because the joy and laughter that comes out of my classroom is just too distracting for the other teachers. A bit more about me is that I'm Assistant Head of Year 10 at Hinchinbrook and I specialise in Nazi Germany. Right, finally we've got Mr. Westbrook. Let's come through. 
Mr. Westbury is the second in department in the history department at Hinchinbrook School. He's an all-round history expert, so you can come to him with questions from ancient history to the Tudors to the Cold War. He's your man to come and speak to. When you start here at Hinchinbrook School, you're going to be looking at Anglo-Saxon England. At some point soon, you're going to be receiving some transition work, which looks at Edward the Confessor, the last Anglo-Saxon king. You need to decipher what makes him a good king, and that's what we're going to look at today. When you start at Hinchinbrook School, we're going to work very hard to turn you into fully-fledged historians. As historians, we use evidence from the past to answer questions today. So we're going to be using this picture to answer the question, what makes a good king? The first thing I'd like to point out about this picture of Edward the Confessor is that he's got the halo, or the nimbus of glory, around his head. In Anglo-Saxon England, religion was really, really important to people, and the king had to be a good Christian. Edward the Confessor was such a good Christian that he was made a saint after his death. You can also see that Edward the Confessor is wearing a crown which shows off his royal status but also his wealth. The fact that Edward the Confessor had the money lying around to buy such lavish items shows how wealthy he was. It also shows how powerful a person is um, and how important they are if they're wearing a crown. Edward the Confessor is also holding a ring. This firstly shows off his wealth once more, but also it is a coronation ring which shows his legitimacy to the throne. No one can challenge his status. Finally, it may not be obvious to you all, but Edward the Confessor is in fact a man. This was really important for Anglo-Saxons to have a male leader. Women were seen as weaker and less intelligent. Obviously, they were wrong. What's missing from this picture is signs of strength and courage of Edward the Confessor. Being a great warrior was really important in Anglo-Saxon England because you had to defend your kingdom. But, Edward the Confessor married Edith Godwin. Her father was one of the most powerful, strong and fearless war leaders in the whole of England. Therefore, when they married, Edward the Confessor had the support of his army behind him. So, what makes a good king? A king needs to be wealthy, they need to have the funds to rule over their country. They need to be a strong warrior. They need to be effective on the battlefield to protect their kingdom from invasion. They need to be religious. In Anglo-Saxon England, religion was really important to the people and many believed that God chose the future king. The king needs to be extremely powerful so that if anyone chose to stand against him, they know that they would be met with fury. They also need to be brave. No one wants a coward as a king. Therefore, they need to be leading the charge on the battlefield and making their people proud. They need to be wise. They need to be able to make decisions that benefit their people. And finally, they need to be fair. If a king is not fair and is cruel, then it's likely that people might stand up against him. Right, we have a task for you to do over the summer in addition to your transition work. You need to make a poster or a video explaining to us why you should be the next leader of England in 1066. I have done an example for you so you can see what we're looking for, but also if you feel like I should be the next leader in 1066, then I approve that message. Why should Miss Brown be the next leader of England? First of all, I have an IQ of 165. That's higher than Einstein. So basically, I'm a genius. This will make me a really good next leader at England in 1066 because I will be able to make wise decisions. I am loaded. I have lost count of all the jewels and gems that I have. Jay-Z and Beyonce look poor in comparison to me. So I have the right amount of mind to be able to rule over England in 1066. I'm a brave and skilled warrior. I have led more armies into battle than you have had hot meals. This will make me a very good leader of England because I will be able to defend the state from any enemies. I'm also very religious. God wants me to be the next ruler of England. So you should choose me to be the next ruler of England in 1066. We really look forward to meeting you all in September. That's if I haven't already been snapped up by an acting agency for my fantastic role in this video. Have a fantastic summer and keep safe. See you in September.
Hi, uh, my name is Mr. Smith. Uh, I am a computer science teacher, and my favourite thing about computer science is how, even if it is not your main subject, every single other subject will use computers and technology nowadays, and they just help make things better and more efficient. Bye. Hi, I'm Mrs Shepherd. I'm one of the computer science and creative by media teachers here at Hinchinbrook. My favourite thing about computer science is the element of problem solving and trying to figure out why something might not be working and everything that you can do with computer science is just amazing so I think you're going to love it too. See you soon. Hello and welcome. To computer science here at Ancient Book School. My name is Mr Bone and I head up a team of computer science specialists here at the school and you may already have heard from Mrs Shepherd and Mr Smith. Why do I love computer science you might ask? Well we are very passionate about computer science here at the school and we learn through computer science how it is used to change the world around us using technology. How it makes things work, such as smart devices in the home and the internet, and how it helps to solve real problems such as how viruses spread across the world. Computer science is used everywhere we look today, in medicine, in transport, in energy, space research, gaming and many, many others. Pretty much every industry needs computer science to help solve problems, and we do it using coding. It also provides some of the most rewarding and exciting careers anywhere in the world today and it could be that one or more of your parents works in the computer science technology industry and they'll be able to tell you a bit more. So, if you wish to learn about how technology and computer science enables our world to work today and probably more importantly how it will work tomorrow then computer science will show you and we will teach you at the school. Here at the Hinchinbrook we have the best computer science curriculum in the area by quite some way this is both very exciting and very relevant to our world and students absolutely embrace all the things we do here at school. That's it for now. We look forward to seeing you in September and teaching you some fantastic computer science things. And remember, computer science is the most in-demand skill in the world today. Thank you. A hostile artificial intelligence called NIM has taken over the world's computers. You're the only person skilled enough to shut it down, and you'll only have one chance. You've broken into NIM's secret lab, and now you're floating in a raft on top of 25 stories of electrified water. You've rigged up a remote that can lower the water level by ejecting it from grates in the sides of the room. If you can lower the water level to zero, you can hit the manual override, shut NIM off, and save the day. However, the AI knows that you're here, and it can lower the water level too, by sucking it through a trap door at the bottom of the lab. If NIM is the one to lower the water level to zero, you'll be sucked out of the lab, resulting in a failed mission. Control over water drainage alternates between you and NIM, and neither can skip a turn. Each of you can lower the water level by exactly one, three, or four stories at a time. Whoever gets the level exactly to zero on their turn will win this deadly duel. Note that neither of you can lower the water level below zero. If the water level is at two, then the only move is to lower the water level one story. You know that Nim has already computed all possible outcomes of the contest and will play in a way that maximizes its chance of success. You go first. How can you survive and shut off the artificial intelligence? You can't leave anything up to chance. NIM will take any advantage it can get, and you'll need to have a response to any possible move it makes. The trick here is to start from where you want to end and work backwards. You want to be the one to lower the water level to zero, which means you need the water level to be at one, three, or four when control switches to you. If the water level were at two, your only option would be to lower it one story, which would lead to Nim making the winning move. If we color code the water levels, we can see a simple principle at play. There are losing levels like two, 
where no matter what whoever starts their turn there does, they'll lose. And there are winning levels where whoever starts their turn there can either win or leave their opponent with a losing level. So not only are 1, 3, and 4 winning levels, but so are 5 and 6, since you can send your opponent to 2 from there. What about 7? From 7, all possible moves would send your opponent to a winning level, making this another losing level. And we can continue up the lab in this way. If you start your turn 1, 3, or 4 levels above a losing level, then you're at a winning level. Otherwise, you're destined to lose. You could continue like this all the way to level 25, but as a shortcut, you might notice that levels 8 through 11 are colored identically to 1 through 4. Since a level's color is determined by the levels 1, 3, and 4 stories below it, this means that level 12 will be the same color as level 5, 13 will match 6, 14 will match 7, and so on. In particular, the losing levels will always be multiple of 7 and 2 greater than multiples of 7. Now, from your original starting level of 25, you have to make sure your opponent starts on a losing level every single turn. If Nim starts on a winning level even once, it's game over for you. So your only choice on turn 1 is to lower the water level by 4 stories. No matter what the AI does, you can continue giving it losing levels until you reach zero and trigger the manual override. And with that, the crisis is averted. Now, back to a less stressful kind of surfing. tour of the languages department so I'm just coming to lower school and the first thing I see in the languages department is all these red lockers some of which might be yours next year and then all the languages rooms are clustered around this area so here we've got room 21 and this is Mrs Melcher Bailey's classroom she is a Spanish teacher um, now this room has been set up according to the coronavirus social distancing guidelines. It doesn't normally look like this, so um, it won't look like this when you start, hopefully. But if it does, hey-ho. Um, and here is Mrs. Melcher Bailey's notice board, and there is a portrait that a student did of her. So that might give you an idea of what she looks like. She's got some nice Spanish memorabilia on the wall here. Um, here's her desk with her computer. She's got some books at the back there, some nice Spanish displays over here. First Spanish words and alphabet, map of Spain. There we go. Some animals in Spanish, que animal es. Okay, let's move on. Let's go to a different classroom. Let's go to my classroom. So this is my classroom, room 18. There we go, room 18, Mrs. Roberts on the door. 7W2, this is where my form is gonna be as well. So this is my classroom, also set out slightly differently to normal. Uh, here are my French conjunctions for people to use when they're writing to remind them to make their sentences more complicated. Um, I've got lots and lots of French postcards and leaflets on the board just on the cupboards just to make everything look a bit brighter um, these are my exercise books where I keep all my uh, different classes books there's some dictionaries there some textbooks and so when you're sitting in the classroom this is what you will see there's my board and some more posters and that's my desk there and some things that are hopefully useful to students to help them improve their work on there. Things you could include in your writing. 
And here's some student work. This is some work that my year 10s did about healthy living, advice for healthy living in French. Des conseils pour une vie saine. Have a look, see if you can work out what some of this advice is. Looking at the pictures and looking at some of the words. Really nice poster there. Okay, let's try one more class through. Out we go, I'll just show you my nice post, my nice French scenes that I've got behind my door. I had a French calendar and I decided to cut up the calendar when it was finished and put up the pictures on the wall. I really like them, some of the places I've been in France. Well, let's go down here and I'll show you some photos from a trip that we went on last year to the north of France, the year eight and nine French trip. I'll show you some of the photos on here. So while we were there, we, tried, we went to a goat farm. We tried some goat's cheese. We went to a snail farm. What do you think we tried there? You guessed it, we tried snails. So there's the girls holding live snails, a bit slimy. And after they'd held them and made friends with them, then they tasted them and ate them. Not those very snails. But yes, that was good fun. What else did we do? We went to a bakery and we made croissant. There's some of the students making croissant. The uh, very funny man giving them instructions. Went to the beach. Here's some games on the beach that we played. There was a volleyball court at the place we stayed, so we played volleyball. So maybe when you come here, when you're in year eight or nine, you can go on a trip. Bonjour, year six. Je m'appelle Madame Roberts. Hola, year six. Me llamo Senora Roberts. I'm the head of languages at Hinchingbrook School. I've been teaching at Hinchingbrook for about six years, uh, but I've been teaching at other schools for a lot longer than that. I've been teaching for about 20 years over that. Um, very much looking forward to meeting most of you in September. I think I'm going to be mostly teaching Spanish uh, this year in year seven, so really looking forward to that. Um, I absolutely love teaching languages, I find it a lot of fun in our lessons at Hinchin, but we do lots of games, lots of songs, um, lots of fun stuff. We'll be out of your seat a lot, speaking to each other, finding out about each other, listening to things. Um, it's all about how you're going to use your language skills in the real world one day. So all the best, have a lovely summer and looking forward to seeing you in September. Adios, au revoir. Bonjour les élèves et bienvenue à Hinchingbrook School. Je m'appelle Madame Riz Bridger et je suis professeur de français. Hello everybody. Welcome to Hinchinbrook School. My name is Mrs. Riz Bridger and I'm one of the French teachers. I'm looking forward to meeting you all when you come to school in September. Au revoir. Goodbye. Hello, you sixes. My name is Mrs. Melcher Bailey from Hinchinbrook School, Mrs. Melcho Bailey from Hinchinbrook School. I will be teaching you Spanish next year. As you can tell, I'm Spanish from Valencia. Does anybody know where Valencia is? Do you know the football team? Maybe something for you to find out. I've been teaching Spanish in Hinchinbrook for a long time. I'm really looking forward to meet you. Um, next um, September. In Spanish we learn lots of things in year 7, things like uh, a few basics that you may all know uh, if you've done Spanish in year 6 
and if you haven't don't worry we'll go through them in September to make sure that everybody is familiar with all the basic things that you need basics such as los números uno dos tres cuatro el alfabeto a b c we also do saludos hola adios que tal they are greetings we also do mi familia my family mi padre mi madre mi hermano mi perro we also will be studying el colegio historia inglés y español and finally we'll be doing a little bit of free time el tiempo libre el fútbol la natación i hope you will enjoy is a very good fun lesson very interactive we'll do lots of reading and writing also lots of pair work role plays talking to each other in spanish we do games and we learn to sing songs in spanish it's all very good fun all the students in year seven love spanish i hope you will as well i'm really looking forward to meet you in um september for now keep well stay safe and Adiós. Bonjour tout le monde. Hello everybody. Salut. Hi. Je m'appelle Madame Tompkins et bienvenue à Français à Hinchinbrook. My name is Mrs. Tompkins and welcome to French at Hinchinbrook. Moi, j'adore les chiens. Me, I love dogs. Et Voici, voici mon chien Dudley. Il s'appelle Dudley. Here's my dog. He's called Dudley. I'm really looking forward to meeting you all and teaching you lots of really exciting, fun French. But in the meantime, prends soin, take care, à bientôt et au revoir. Hola, me llamo Senora Hobbs. Bonjour, je m'appelle Madame Hobbs. Hello, my name is Mrs. Hobbs. So, can you guess which two languages I teach at Hinchingbrook? French and Spanish, of course. I've been teaching at Hinchingbrook for 10 years now. When we learn languages, we learn a variety of topics about describing yourself, where you live, what you do in your free time, your school, and many other topics. We have lots of fun learning languages. We learn songs, we do many activities, group work activities, we do games. So you will enjoy learning languages at Hinchingbrook. I'm very much looking forward to meeting you when you come to Hinchingbrook. I hope you enjoy your summer. Adios, au revoir, goodbye. Bonjour, hola. Hello, uh, my name is Mr. Tandy. I teach modern languages and English. Um, my main language is German. Uh, unfortunately, at the, this point in time, that's only something that we uh, we do with older students, but uh, I do teach French at Key Social as well as uh, English across all year groups. Um, so may well see some of you next year. Um, learning a language is uh, a really great opportunity um, particularly starting in year seven there's a lot of fun a lot of games a lot of uh, songs and it's quite a different experience in the classroom to um, many of your other subjects and um, learning a language is is not just about the language you're learning it is about learning uh, to see things in a different perspective it's a really good transferable skill it helps you to uh, be able to learn other languages more easily in the future whether that's for work for personal reasons or whatever and um, it does give you a, a whole kind of different uh, approach in terms of the sort of things you can do rather than being limited to uh, jobs or careers or opportunities uh, where you can only speak English you've got all of those opportunities uh, but working with or in 
other countries as well. So uh, we hope to see you soon and hope you are keeping well during this challenging time and uh, hope you enjoy your experience learning a language at Hinchinbrook. My name is Sam. I have been studying Spanish. My teachers are Miss Melchor Bailey and Miss Solvar. This year we have been learning a lot of things, but my favourite bits are learning about Christmas, learning about the culture, and learning about the numbers. Because here at Hinchinbrook, that's actually really fun compared to primary school. Hasta la vista. Goodbye. languages lesson is like at Hinchinbrook and I'm going to tell you some information about that now. Your languages lessons will be in one of our special languages classrooms. They are rooms 17, 18, 19, 20 and 21 and so at the start of the lesson you will wait outside that classroom and your teacher will come and invite you to come in. You will have a particular seat to sit in that your teacher will assigned to you and you go to that seat and you sit down and you get out your equipment. You will need a pen, you will need your planner, this is my teacher's planner, your planner won't look like this. You will need your exercise book, I haven't got one of those with me at the moment, that lives in the classroom, but occasionally you will have to take that home and you must make sure you remember to bring it back in again if you've had to take it home to do some homework. Um, and you will need probably a ruler, pencil, and that's about it. If you've got a French or Spanish dictionary at home and you would like to bring that in, that's brilliant. We have dictionaries though in the classroom, so you absolutely don't have to bring one. Um, we have these, this is one of the Spanish dictionaries that we have. We've got French ones as well. Okay, and we also use in lessons, textbooks. This is a French year seven textbook, Studio A. Um, and we have one, ones for Spanish as well. Um, but again, this, these belong to the school. Don't go home with you. Don't need to worry about bringing that with you or anything like that. Okay. Um, so that's the start of the lesson. We get everything set up and then off we go. And then at the end of the lesson, when your teacher tells you, you pack everything away. Exercise book usually goes in the box in the classroom, but possibly you'll have to take it home to do some homework. Um, stand behind your chair and wait to be dismissed and off you will go. Um, and I don't think I need to tell you any more about that. You'll find out more about what it's like in the language lesson next year. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna get do an activity with you that is typical of the kind of thing we do in languages lessons. It's going to be a French activity and I know some of you will be doing Spanish and some of you may never have done French before but that's okay it's going to be dead easy just to give you an idea. I want you to imagine that you're in the classroom with me and you're going to repeat after me so um, it's going to be a bit weird because you're not actually here with me in my house but just imagine that you are and just give it a go. Okay, so I've got some numbers here. Let's try to get these in a position where you can see all of my cheese paper. My daughter made this for me this morning. Okay, so these are the numbers. Now, I bet some of you know the French numbers, but let's have a little practice. Do we know this one? Ah, 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 ah. Can you say that? Ah, ah, ah. Well done. De. De, 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 un, un, un. de, 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 trois, 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 un, deux, trois, quatre, quatre, cinq. Cinq. Un, deux, trois, quatre, cinq. Okay, here we go. Bottom line. Six. Six, six, six. Six, six, six. 
super. Cease, cease, cease. Set. Set. Un, deux, trois. Quatre, cinq, six. Set. Huit. Neuf. Huit. Set. Neuf. Huit. Set. Dix. Dix, dix, dix. Un, deux, trois. Quatre, cinq, six. Sept, huit, neuf. Dix, dix, dix. Très bien. Okay. Now we're going to play a game. So you're going to repeat after me. Occasionally I'm going to say the wrong number. So I'm going to point to this, but say not un, but cinq. Okay. Now if I say the wrong one, you don't say it. You have to keep silent. Okay. Now you've got three lives. So if you make a mistake, it doesn't matter. And we're going to see if we can go all the way through without you making a mistake or without you losing all your lives anyway. Okay, here we go. So we'll do a proper practice first. Un, deux, trois, quatre, cinq, six, sept, huit, neuf, dix. Okay, that was our proper practice. We're going to, I'm going to start the game now. Okay, here we go. Un, deux, Quatre. Right, if you say quatre, then you lost a life. It should have been trois. Okay, here we go. Trois. Quatre. Six. If you said six, then you lost a life because it should have been cinq. Six. Sept. Neuf. Oh, some of you might have lost a life then because that should be huit. Huit. Neuf. Dix. Okay, we've got all the way to the end. We're going to go, I've got to get through twice though. Okay, here we go. Starting again. De. Oh, that was wrong, wasn't it? Should have been a. A. De. Huit. Wrong. Should have been trois. Trois. Six. Wrong. Should have been quatre. Dix. Wrong. Should have been cinq. Six. Set. Neuf. Wrong. Should have been wheat. Dix. Wrong. Should have been neuf. Un. Wrong. Should have been dix. Shouldn't it? Well done. Okay. Well done. If you've got any lives intact, I'll be very impressed because I was going quite fast then. That's the kind of thing we're doing lessons just to learn some new language and make it a bit more fun.